let's jump into lucid dreaming. Yeah, lucid dreaming, it used to be a complete charlatan science. You know, back mm -hmm. in the 60s and the 70s, to suggest that you could gain control over a normally non-volitional process only added insult to the idiotic nature of this thing called sleep and dreaming by itself. And now you're telling me, okay, we've got these things called dreams and also you claim to be able to control them and do whatever you like in them. Really? I, you know, show me some good science. But now we have some exquisite science and it's not even debated anymore. It's not a charlatan science. And the first experiments <laughs> actually come back to our first topic, which was sleep and sex. The first experiments used orgasm and ejaculation as the test. So with a lucid dreamer, when they are asleep, just like you and I, when we're not lucid dreaming, they are paralyzed. So they've got no good way to tell you, okay, I'm now lucid. And they have no way to tell you what I'm dreaming about and what's happening, except that they do, which is their eyes. Because mm -hmm. one of the two muscle groups that is spurred from the voluntary skeletal paralysis of your muscles are the extraocular muscles that move your eyes up and down and left and right. And that's why, by the way, you still have rapid eye movements during REM sleep because those muscles are not inhibited. So we can now generate essentially a language between me, the experimenter, and you, the lucid dreamer, which is like a, an ocular Morse code. And you can be telling me using predefined eye movement instructions what's going on. So at the moment you become lucid, you've gone into dream sleep, and I can see that in the next door sleep control center. And then all of a sudden I see based on your eye movement traces that I'm measuring, you do three deliberate flicks to the left. And that's your signal to me that me, the participant, I'm now lucid. Okay, great. Now then you're going to do two big circular movements to the right. And that's you saying in my dream, I'm now clenching my right hand and then moving your eyes circular to the left. That's me moving my left hand. And so you can be telling me every time that you're doing something in your dream, what it is that you're doing, which is, I mean, could you imagine who this is? <laughs> and then if you're like, if you like that trick, now watch me ejaculate. <laughs> well, that was exactly what they did. So then they said, okay, you claim to be able to, because when you control lucid dreaming, by the way, the definition is just that you are aware that you're dreaming as you are dreaming. That's our basic scientific definition. But what most people in the lay public think of as lucid dreaming is not just that you know that you're dreaming, you take control of your dreams. And of course, if you can control your dreams, one of the things that people enjoy doing is, you know, having sex and having an orgasm. That's all they're going to do. That's all they're going to do. Yeah, the exactly. Orgy everywhere. It was the original <laughs> dreamscape pornography, you know, forget Pornhub. You just had to lose a dream. It's so, heavier lift. But yeah. Yeah, it is, but you know, I could argue it's well <laughs> worth it. And so we've got these experiments now. And by the way, we've done imaging studies that are less messy for the experimenter to, to prove by, <laughs> but I should come, I should explain that by the way, people would then say, okay, I'm now starting to have sex and I'm now just about to have an orgasm. And then they would say, I've just had my orgasm and you can go into the room. And sure enough, with males, especially, you've got proof positive data that what they said was real. And hence, you've just scientifically proven lucid dreaming is, is correct. Mm -hmm. We've got much more sophisticated MRI scanning methods now, and I, I won't bore you with the studies, but it's very clear that we know that lucid dreaming is real. The next question then was, how? How do people lucid dream? What is the underlying neural mechanism? Yeah. And this comes back to the prefrontal cortex and those dorsolateral prefrontal parts of the, the brain, which are the volitional control centers, which go offline. What we found is that activity, both the electrical activity and also when you put people in scanners, the imaging activity in those regions starts to ramp back up again, as if when you become lucid, you regain your rational, logical control over the dream state. And so the prefrontal cortex gives you that capacity to take back what you lost, which is volition. There was a study recently, however, that I think did a pretty good job to say that may not be the case, that some of those are, results are confounded by the method of the analysis and the method of the recording. So I think it's the jury is still a little bit out. But even in that study, they demonstrated that there's something about their brainwaves that is radically different at that 
fulcrum point where they shift from going from non-lucid dreaming to lucid dreaming. It's not a question of if, it's just how. What is the jury still out on? I'm sorry, I missed that. So the jury is still out on this idea that the electrical bursting brainwave activity is recapitu- comes back online over the prefrontal cortex. And what they were finding is that it's potentially an artifact of the eye movements that start to happen. So the eye movements, when you're moving those muscles, those extraocular muscles, you move muscles using electrical impulses. And right. those electrical impulses that are coming from the eye will also yeah, right. bleed up into the brain. And when you get mm-hmm. all of this frenetic eye movement, it starts to masquerade as if it's the prefrontal cortex, which sits directly above them as mm-hmm. getting re-engaged. And hence, when you control for that, you don't see as powerful an argument for the re-engagement of the prefrontal cortex. What is your personal experience, if any, with lucid dreaming? Unfortunately, I am not a common lucid dreamer. It's happened probably about two or three times in my life. Mm -hmm. And when it's happened, it's immensely pleasurable. Have I tried to curate it, develop it, and use different techniques, and we can speak about the current techniques that are out there in the science. Mm -hmm. I have not chosen to do that. And it's not necessarily because I see in the science anything to be worried about. I can steel man both sides of that argument. We know that only about 10 to 20% of the population are natural lucid dreamers. And you could argue from an evolutionary standpoint that lucid dreaming is so adaptive, so beneficial to us homo sapiens, then the reverse would be true, that Mother Nature would have heavily selected it, and 80 to 90% of the population would be lucid dreamers. But I can push back on my own argument because there's a desperate flaw in that logic. That argument assumes that we've stopped evolving, and we haven't. Right. So maybe that 10 to 20% of natural lucid dreamers are the forefront of hominid evolution. And we don't need to be worried about AI. We need to be worried about the, the lucid dreamers becoming the next super race of you know, humanity. So I wrestle between those two. If it's that volume though, that 80 to 90% of people don't naturally do it at this stage of after 3.x million years of, of evolution of hominid development, my sense is that Do I think that I understand better than Mother Nature's blueprint exactly what I should be serving up in my dreams at night to get all of the benefits of dreams? And by the way, we know that dreaming above and beyond REM sleep itself serves a number of key different functions like emotional therapy and emotional first aid. It supports creativity. And I've worried myself, is it hubris for me to think that I should then take the reins and get into the the driver's cockpit and start steering the vehicle rather than just allowing whatever Mother Nature thinks should happen for me. I don't know. The only other strike against lucid dreaming, and I don't think it's a big one and I don't think it's anything to be worried about, when you survey people and when we've examined people who claim to be lucid dreamers, on a night after lucid dreaming, they typically report that their sleep is less restorative and less refreshing they find it to be perhaps more mentally fatiguing. But I don't think that's really a the big... The second night, the subsequent night of sleep. No, sorry. The next morning when they wake up after the night when they have had lucid dreaming, oh, interesting. they find that it, it was more fatiguing, perhaps because it's more effortful, because you're engaging the prefrontal cortex. That's one argument. But I don't think that's a particularly good argument to say that If you are a lucid dreamer, you need to be worried. Or if you want a lucid dream, you should not engage in some of the different methods that we've developed to improve it. I'm curious what the state of the art is from a scientific perspective, because people may hear the term lucid dreaming and think that it is a relatively new construct slash exercise of the human mind, but that's not true at all. At least, I mean, for thousands of years in Tibetan practices and elsewhere, Exactly. There have been elaborate descriptions of training and philosophical and cosmological implications of this type of sleep engineering, let's call it. So what are the predominant methods of or for inducing lucidity in these studies or that you've seen covered in the literature? I'm very curious. 
Yeah, right now, in terms of the science, we probably have two methods that have been put out that, that have some degree of validity to them. Although I would say that when you look at each one of the papers, the statistical robustness in terms of the reliability of these things, it's not especially high. I mean, some of these techniques do gain statistical significance, meaning that when you try them, it does significantly, from a statistical perspective, increase your likelihood of lucid dreaming. The first one is called, it's called the MILD method for short, but it stands yeah. for the Mnemonic Induction of Lucid Dreaming, M-I-L-D method. And essentially, it's pretty simple that you create a conscious and very deliberate intention to remember that you're dreaming. And usually this is pre-bed, that you're lying there before you go to sleep and you start repeating this intention. I am going to deliberately remember that I am dreaming as I am dreaming. And you keep doing that night after night over and over again. And it sounds hokey. It sounds really quite, you know, science L-I-T-E light. But the evidence <laughs> is suggesting it's in favor. I think the other one that's probably more popular is called the reality testing method. And it's, oh gosh, it's it was popularized, or at least I think it was popularized. Stephen Leberge? No, Stephen Leberge was a fascinating researcher who was working here in the Bay Area in the 1980s and 90s, who probably was really the pioneer of modern day lucid dreaming. And then at some point he was doing academic you know, really interesting scientific studies. And then he moved away and he developed his own Lucidity Institute and sort of was selling CDs to how to do that. And so I think it went off in a slightly strange direction. And I don't know what came of him, but the reality testing method actually came to fruition on many people's radars with a brilliant movie called Waking Life by Richard Linklater. Have you yeah, seen this? It's great. It yeah. is a, if people, and maybe we can link to it in the show notes, if people haven't watched it, don't worry if you're not interested in lucid dreaming. Yes, the movie revolves around lucid dreaming, but the philosophy and the conversations will blow your mind. Yeah. It is one of my favorite. And the visual treatment of the movie. Oh, is so is clever. Is so clever. Yeah. Isn't it genius? And maybe we won't spoil it for people who haven't seen it, but the idea of the reality testing method is that during the waking day, you start to test reality in a way that you don't normally do. So let's say that I would walk over to the table that I'm sitting next to here and I press my hand down on the table and the table is re resisting my hand, just like the waking laws of physics would predict. Or I go over to the wall and I switch on the light switch. Do the lights go on? And when I turn them off, do they go off? And hence, I understand that I'm probably in conscious waking reality. And you start doing this throughout your entire waking day to the point where it becomes a reflexive habit. And then the hope is that that habit bleeds through into your dreaming life from your waking life and you start to do the same reality testing in dreams and then all of a sudden i press my hand down on the table and it moves all the way through the table to the other side and at that point i think oh the jig is up i'm not awake i'm dreaming mm -hmm. and then you gain lucidity 